This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. Thank you to Pastor Strong and to the Bishop and to all of our officials from Washington and to all of our activists, civil rights leaders, the chair lady of the NAACP is also with us. Please stand, our chair lady. And mostly to our foot soldiers from 1965. Come on, give them a big hand. Want to turn to the book of Joshua. First chapter, beginning at the fifth verse. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. I want to use for a thought 50 years after the march, God's promise, God's promise. Several years ago, the speaker here on a Sunday morning was then Senator Barack Obama. And the senator who is now president talked about that there was the Moses generation, the foot soldiers and many that we've heard from this morning. And then he said that those of us behind in what would be the mid age now were the Joshua generation. Well, Yesterday, as we were, some of us, were marching across the bridge, I reminded him now that he and I both are a lot grayer. And I reminded him about the Joshua generation. The problem with the Joshua generation is it does not go by age. It goes by commitment. There were many people that were in the Moses age generation that was not in the movement. Just cause you are old don't mean we owe you no gratitude today. And there are many in the Joshua generation that are not engaged now. The real way you separate them is by those that are committed to the journey and committed why because there is a distortion of why we've taken this journey i've been wrestling with it bishop and it came together for me on that bridge yesterday amelia boykin yeah. over a hundred years old yeah. in her wheelchair I happened to be standing between her and the president as we got across to the halfway point. And John Lewis stopped and said he wanted to speak. And he started explaining what had happened at that point where Hosea Williams and him were beaten. And then Ms. Boykin said, but let me speak. <laughs> and from her wheelchair, she talked about how she had been registering voters. And she talked about how she was beaten that day, but kept registering voters. Yeah. 
And she said, but I was registering them because I felt if we could vote, we could deal with poverty and deal with the killing of our people and deal with what was going on wrong and unfair. Right. Sound real simple, but what struck me was that we are in many ways more caught up in what we are getting out of the journey than what the journey was for. Go right back to Joshua's story. Don't forget, when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt land, and God made a way for them, open up the Red Sea, and Martin, they marched across into the wilderness, they forgot the reason for the journey and started worshiping the wrong God. The reality is in this celebration, some of us have been lost in the wilderness 50 years. Some of us thought that Miss Boynton and John Lewis and Jose Williams got beat for you to get a certain position and a certain job. Some of you thought this was about you. Rather than realize that, yes, it was about voting. But not voting to get you a big title, voting hoping that if we put you somewhere that you would transform society and make it better. And Young was right. It's not about making what was wrong go from white to blacks doing wrong. It's about making what's wrong right. We weren't looking for darker colored oppressors. We were looking for freedom. What difference does it make if you got white churches ceremonial being replaced by black churches ceremonial? Where we meet out of custom rather than conviction. And where some have reduced the pulpit to a lotto machine. Where you just show up every week to see if God gave you your Lexus yet. That's not why we wanted to come out of Egypt. Now, I, I was born, raised in Brooklyn, New York. My mother was from down here. I never sat in the back of a bus. I was only 10 years old with the march. I wasn't here in 65. In fact, the town I grew up in, New York, were much more vibrant, much more militant. My pastor, Bishop Washington, brought me to Reverend Jones, Operation Breadbasket, and said that if he's going to be involved in all this social stuff, at least let him be with the preachers. I'd been a boy preacher, toured with Mayor Jackson's little boy at nine. They wanted me to stay in the church. So I joined Operation Breadbasket, met a guy that was as old as me as Dr. King was, him a little older, who had a big afro, so I kind of liked his style. He was a little more militant. <laughs> Named Reverend Jesse Jackson. <laughs> and he talked more than we could relate it. So I came in the movement through that way. And I didn't understand that it took more courage to be nonviolent than to ball up your fists and talk. And I didn't understand that you can't transform a nation without transforming yourself. And what was a regional movement in the South, Jackson and others, broadened it and where we urbanized it and where we understood that it was not the style. But the reason that brought this movement to where now the whole world imitates what is done here. There's a reason folk are in Selma today. We're not here to celebrate. We're here to commemorate and then continue. 
This is not just a commemoration. It's a continuation. Because right here in Alabama, the 20th century Alabama was known for its segregation and race. 21st century is known for its trampling on immigration rights and homophobia. And a lot of y'all don't want to deal with that, but you can't fight for anybody's rights unless you're going to fight for everybody's rights. Something sick about elected officials seeing 36% poverty in town. But you more concerned with what's going on in somebody's bedroom than the food in the kitchen. Something wrong about telling churches they can't take care of children until they check out their parents' immigration status. And then get up and preach, love your neighbor. Something hypocritical about standing up in front of a bridge celebrating people that were beat and then go straight to Montgomery and legislate voter ID laws and legislate ending early voting and legislate stopping Sunday souls to the poll. Something hypocritical about honoring Dr. King and then running Shelby through the Supreme Court and taking out the core of the Voting Rights Act and saying that, yeah, you can have the act, but no pre-clearance, meaning we can do whatever we want to do. And we don't have to check with the Justice Department before we do it. And by the way, in case you want to go to the Justice Department, we're going to hold the Attorney General in contempt because it's contemptible to us he was the Attorney General in the first place. to lecture our children about doing wrong, and we do, and we should. You tell us about family responsibility, and we should, and we do. And then you take someone who went to law school and did everything right, stayed with his family, raised his children, went to the best schools, the best example, becomes president and you ask him for his birth certificate, the other attorney general, and you hold him in contempt. What are we supposed to tell our children? I, I, I understand that you don't like those that yell back. I know y'all got problems with me. It's all right if you don't like me. I ain't crazy about y'all. But they did everything you claim you believe in. And you still maligned them. Loretta Lynch. Nobody on no side of the aisle could find nothing wrong with her. So they just gave up and started asking her about Eric Holder because they couldn't find nothing on her. And you still take the longest time in recent American history to confirm her vote. And you don't think we noticed that? <laughs> we know the difference. We know why they went across that bridge. And that still some bridges we have to cross. We know the reason for the fight. It was never about getting black faces in high places. The reason was so that we could change and make fair and just. 
not only for us, but for everybody. Amen. Yesterday was not a anniversary of a new marriage in America. It was the celebration of a newborn baby. Barack Obama is a child as a result of the Voting Rights Act. But the two forces married in the Voting Rights Act is in court. You filed for divorce with the Shelby Act. We are no longer in unison. You are fighting in the state of Alabama against pre-clearance right now. We ain't going to the bridge with nostalgia. We going to the bridge again to let you know like we did 50 years ago, you will not deny our right to vote. You going to file Shelby, get a Supreme Court vote, nullify us with section four, and then come and ask his son to help celebrate his daddy and think he's not going to stand up for what his daddy lived for. You think that we don't understand that much of what happened in this town, you're trying to rescind in a new and more polished way. The language of Jim Crow has changed into the polished court papers of James Crow Jr. Esquire. But the results are the same. And that's disenfranchisement. And now some of our young people, just like when I was young, said don't even try that. We're not going to try the system. That's what Sherlin was talking about. But when they understand, Jackson had to tell me, well, wait a minute, y'all get mad, but y'all can't be on juries if you're not registered to vote. And judges get registered to vote. And when we break down what this system is, we've got to leave here today not talking about what we did, but what we must do now. We're committed in Nash Acts Network, we're going to Washington again. And we're going to force this Congress to deal with a Voting Rights Act to put a new map there. I sat in the courtroom with Martin III when Scalia during the hearing on Shelby started talking about racial entitlements. Not a racial entitlement to have your vote protected, it's an American entitlement. And we intend to deal with direct action in Washington, D.C. on it. But as we come back, let us remember, that's why the journey started. There was some that asked Moses, why didn't you leave us in Egypt? The journey is too rough. It's hard journey. You never get credit. And the young fight all his life. And because he does something, as mayor and ambassador that makes progress privately. He's got to worry about being condemned by his own while he's being attacked by the enemy. Jackson got to worry about how if he stands too strident, they use that against us. But if he stays with us, we act like there's something wrong. He can't go nowhere else. We kill our living leaders and exalt our dead leaders. As soon as they die, we name buildings after them and monuments after them. But as long as they're here, we beat them down and hand them to the enemy. It's hard. You only do this if you bleed in what you're doing. Look at folk lying at you, on you and having to smile through it all. That's why only spiritual people end up leading this movement. 
Because you got to deal with people that are on another frequency than you. Reason I can fight the way I fight is they on AM, I'm on FM, I'm not on their frequency. You got to get where we were talking about tonight, Bishop Proctor. You got to get where Bishop Jesus had got to such a high frequency. To the last thing he did, last supper, served everybody. Knew he was getting ready to be betrayed. Last thing he did is he got up from the table, took off his garment, laid it down, and got down on his knees. They said, what you doing, Jesus? I'm going to wash your feet. Well, why are you going to wash our feet? He said, because the greatest is the servant. And maybe if you understand, it's not about how high you sit, but how low you can go to serve the people. But I'm going to tell you something deeper than that. Took me many years before I peeped this part. Not only did he get down and wash his disciples' feet, he knew that one of them were going to betray him. He knew, Pastor, that that night he was going to be sold out by one of his own disciples. But he didn't call him out. He didn't dismiss him. He washed the feet of Judas. Even though he knew that Judas was going to betray him. And he said, what you going to do? Go on and do it quickly. You ain't got enough religion till you can look your traitor in the face and serve him anyhow. Spiritual people will make you look at dogs in Birmingham and sing, We Shall Overcome. Spiritual people will make you go to the bridge named after Klansmen and take tear gas and look in the future and say, I don't know when and I don't know how, but God will make a way somehow. Spiritual people. Don't calculate their steps, but they know their steps are ordered by the law. Spiritual people. That's what brought us this far. I tell my daughters, one is here with me today, that I heard one or two of our speakers talk about faith. Let me tell you something, we're in a technological age. But there are some things you ain't going to be able to Google up the answer. <laughs> some things your laptop can't give you the answer. And that's where something else kicks in. Faith ain't what you can figure out. Faith ain't what you can calculate. Faith is when it don't make sense. Faith is when it looks like it's all over. Faith is when you shouldn't do it, but something in you make you go ahead anyhow. Faith is the substance of things. Hope for the evidence of things not seen. Faith is when the doctors give up, but you hold on for another doctor. Faith is when you got a pile of bills and no money. But you say he will provide all of my needs. Faith is when your friends walk out. When your loved ones turn your name. When they forget about what you did. But you say, I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me now. We come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord. Trusting in his holy word. He never, he never, he never failed me yet. Let me say this and we are going on. Pastor Strong, 
I remember January 2013. I was sitting with Martin the third and his wife. And we were guests to the president at his second inauguration. We sit about the fifth row and we was sitting there and saw Mrs. Obama come out, Ambassador Young with two Bibles. The president was going to be sworn in for the second term with Abe Lincoln's Bible and Dr. King's traveling Bible. Now I remember a senator about two rows behind me, Miss Lynch. Well, I say, Mr. Holick, I don't want to get in the way of your confirmation. <laughs> let, me, let me talk to him. I don't know Miss Lynch that well. <laughs> Senator about three rows behind me said, Ramal, I said, yeah. He said, it's an awesome moment. I said, yes, it is. He said, to see this president put his hand on Lincoln's Bible and Dr. King's Bible and being sworn in, he says it's an awe-inspiring moment. I said, yes, it is. I said, but don't be confused. He said, what you mean? I said, well, they're two identical Bibles. Tom Joyner, they had the same amount of books, same amount of verses, same amount of chapters. Wasn't no difference in the Bible. But the difference was Lincoln's Bible had been on the mantel place in the White House. Heads of states and captains of industry and, and men of military used to look at that Bible. But Dr. King's Bible didn't come that way. Dr. King's Bible came through the backwoods of Georgia, and through the bayous of Mississippi. Yeah. If you open up the inside, you might see a cell number. Because when he went to jail, they would check his Bible in his property and then send it through the necessary institutional obligations for him to have his Bible. But little did the bailiffs know when they were checking in Dr. King's Bible in Birmingham that one day that Bible would be on the steps of the Capitol swearing in the President of the United States. That's why we in self. Because we came for a reason, not a season. And though we suffered, God made a way for us. We here not to celebrate something that didn't happen. We're here to celebrate a God that heard the cry of our parents. And we're not going to let our parents and God down now. They died to give us the right to vote. Black and white died in this state to give us the right to vote. Goodman, Cheney, Swerner, Viola Louisa died in Alabama and died in Mississippi to give us the right to vote. And we come back to Alabama to let you know you are not going to take that right back. One preacher said to me, well, Reverend, we, we, we are all Christians. We believe in the same thing. I said, well, you know, one of the things I never understood, my, 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 my mentors in the movement never explained to me, is why when the Klan, I'm from up north, maybe somebody know, I don't. Why the Klan, George Gresham, would, when they would terrorize, why they would burn the cross. It's supposed to be Christians, but they would burn the cross. But a friend told me, you know why I said, because when some gave us Christianity, they didn't know the spirituality that we had. Saw the Jesus as the one that stood up against oppression. The one that fed the hungry and clothed the naked. The one that gave uh, affordable health care yeah. to Bartimaeus. Yeah. 
When we got through with Jesus, they had to try to destroy the Jesus we know. I know why they burned the cross. Because somewhere they realized it was at the cross. At the cross. Where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. You put me in the back of the bus, but you couldn't block me from the cross. It was at the cross, at the cross, where I got my strength. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I'm his own. He been fooled when I was hungry. He been watered when I was thirsty. He's my rock, my sword and shield, my wheel, my wheel, my wheel. In the middle of the wheel, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Yes, yes, yes. I heard strong. I'm gonna sit down for real, but I heard strong reading my bio. But there's a part you didn't read. There have been times that I had to cry sometimes. He walks with me in my life. I've had to cry sometimes in my life. I've walked alone sometimes. I've been lied on, cheated, talked about. I've been mistreated. I've been up, I've been down. I've been leveled to the ground. I've been stabbed, I've been prosecuted. But through it all, through it all, through it all, I, 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 I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I, 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 I've learned to depend on his word he'll make a way he'll make a way he'll make a way yes he will yes he will yes 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 yes, yes. yes. you know when i came in today i heard the choir sing i saw the young man did high octaves that had everybody standing up. I wish I could sing like that, but God didn't give me that gift. I heard the young lady lead her song, but God didn't give me that gift. But sometime Ambassador Young, in the midnight hours, after my cell phone stopped ringing, after the doorbell quiets down, I go out in my living room all by myself and I sing my song I can't sing for Sunday morning service I can't sing for 50th anniversary program but I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eyes his eyes his eyes is on the sparrow. I, 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 I know he watches me. Yeah.